Good morning, everyone. My name is Eleni. I'm the marketing manager at the Big Five in Dubai. Thank you for joining our webinar today, Access Construction Projects in Miasa and Participation of German Companies at the Big Five. The webinar will be recorded and everyone will receive a recording of the webinar in a few days' time. If you have any questions, please direct them to the relevant speaker in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We will ask these questions at the end of the presentation. I will now pass you on to Metap Gosoy, the event director at the Big Five in Dubai, who will introduce our speakers. Hi, Metap. Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar organized for German companies who would like to explore Middle East, Africa and South Asia region. In the next hour, we will talk about the following topics. First, Ed James, Director of Content and Analysis, Meet, will talk about the Middle East and Africa project market opportunities for German firms. Then, Iris Heinz, the International Senior Consultant, German Emirati Joint Council for Industry and Commerce, will talk about German businesses in the UAE past, present, and the future, what will be the impact of COVID-19. Lastly, I, Metap Gursoy, event director, the Big Five Dubai DMG events, will give you more information about the Big Five. We will end the webinar with a Q&A session. As Eleni highlighted, please mention who would you like to address your question to the, into the Q&A box. Over to you, Ed. Thank you, Metap, and uh, good afternoon from Dubai. Good morning to you all in uh, Germany. It's a pleasure to be once again uh, speaking to you all about opportunities in the Miasa uh, market. Um, this time, uh, we actually uh, are doing it uh, digitally, but uh, I'm sure and I hope it's going to be just as effective and just as informative uh, for you. Uh, just as Lenny and Metap uh, mentioned, uh, this is being recorded, so there is a lot of data in this uh, webinar, in this presentation, but it's been recorded and you'll be able to look at it uh, later in your own time. Um, I should also like to remind you that you can add your questions in the uh, Q&A chat box below uh, throughout the course of the presentation, and then we will try to get around to answering them uh, later on and towards the end of this webinar. Okay, so without further ado, let's start uh, looking at the, the, the projects market in the regions concerned. Uh, first off, uh, who am I and what do I work for? I work, uh, my name is Edward James and I work for Mead Projects. Uh, Mead Projects is a projects tracking uh, database and service. Uh, you can learn more about it by visiting meadprojects.com. And we are currently tracking more than 15 thousand live projects in the Middle East and Africa and it's by tracking these projects that we are able to quantify uh, the data and present you with the analysis that we are going to today. So as I said if you want more information uh, please either contact me directly or visit our website to learn more. Okay so um, obviously there's been a lot of um, changes uh, recently so let's take a look at uh, where the market stands today. First of all, I think um, while every country is quite different, I think they all share uh, quite a few uh, key drivers, um, the most important of which are um, strong economic and population growth uh, generally. Okay, so with fast growing populations, you need a lot of social infrastructure, you need more housing, uh, but you need more schools and healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare projects, you also need more roads, airport capacity, and of course you also need more power and water production capacity. Um, and that, I think, is the, the key driver uh, for uh, project development over the last 20 years or so. At the same time, we've got a great need for infrastructure and we've got government long-term visions, such as the famous Saudi 2030 vision, which are driving project investment and driving foreign investment in the projects markets in general uh, in the uh, Miasa region. So let's just take a look at the uh, GCC, for example, and see how big the, the market is and which are the main markets uh, in the region. So uh, we can see that in 2019, uh, we had approximately $102 billion uh, worth of contracts awarded. And indeed, we've seen between 100 and $150 billion of contracts awarded in each of the last 15 years. So we've had 
uh, more than a trillion dollars worth of contracts awarded uh, just in the GCC alone uh, in the last two decades and um, more than uh, one and a half trillion dollars if we take into account the whole uh, MENA region. Now, just as the GCC, uh, pinpointed the GCC, we can see that the largest project market is Saudi Arabia currently, about $46 billion or just under half of this $102 billion. We then have the UAE at about $30.6 billion. Qatar, Amman, Kuwait and Bahrain are a bit smaller than the two largest markets, but nonetheless offer some considerable market opportunities as well. So we have um, just in the GCC and uh, six very vibrant, very active project markets, uh, a lot of um, activity going on in those markets. And just in terms of the type of projects uh, that have been awarded over the last few years, you can see that construction at, uh, last year, $37 billion of contracts is by far and away the largest uh, pro project sector uh, in the region, uh, followed by uh, transport, last year, $16 billion of projects. And then, as you might expect from the MENA region, oil and gas, uh, also quite important, uh, but also, of course, power and water as the populations are growing. So we've got very significant uh, uh, project activity led by the construction sector uh, in the MENA region. So who are the top uh, contractors currently uh, in the GCC? Well, as you can see from this list here, um, this is by type, uh, by value of work underway by each contractor. You can see that there's a mixture, a nice mixture of both local and international contractors and companies uh, involved in the market. We've got Saudi contractors like ABV Rock Group, Nesman Partners. We've also got um, Indian contractors like Shapoji. We've got the Chinese, China State Construction, Turkish companies like Limac, uh, more Chinese like Sina Hydro, uh, Italian contractors like Cellini. Uh, so we've got uh, Belgian contractors like B6. So we've got a wide range of different contractors in the market. And that same in, that is, uh, goes also for suppliers and subcontractors. So we have suppliers from all around the world active in the project market uh, in the Miasa region. Simply put, there isn't enough manufacturing capacity within the region uh, to meet all the project requirements and therefore a lot of supplies and equipment and services are imported from around the world. There's no particular distinction from any particular region. Everything is open and uh, has an opportunity for international companies. Just in terms of contractors, just to give you a flavor of this, you can see how broadly mixed uh, this, this, this is. So we have Chinese contractors, which are growing in strength as they, as they are across the world. Uh, in the Miasa region, you can see Chinese contractors have um, nearly $19 billion of contracts underway in the GCC. Turkey also, $16.5 billion. India, then we've got Italy, uh, we've got Korea, which has been long time uh, strong in the region. Greece, Spain, France, Belgium, Australia, Netherlands. So we can see that every country around the world and region has an opportunity to participate in the projects market in the Miasa region. Now in terms of clients, we're just taking a look here at the top clients in the GCC. It's important to bear in mind that in the, uh, in the MENA region particularly, uh, the the project market is dominated by the public sector. Its government clients tend to be the uh, dominant force in terms of tendering and um, sponsoring projects as well as paying for them. And therefore, uh, projects are closely linked to the uh, oil price and fortunes of the uh, government budgets. So here we've got a flavor of some of the big uh, uh, companies and sponsoring projects and most of them as you can see here are government or government related entities like the Saudi Public Investment Fund and their projects which I will go more on later. Uh, we also have um, Dubai Holding, quasi government entity in Dubai, we've got uh, the Transport Authority of Saudi Arabia, we've got Saudi Aramco of course, the Ministry of Interior in Saudi Arabia, we've got the Public Authority of Housing Welfare in Kuwait and so on. Um, we've got, by and large, most of the key clients in uh, the region are uh, government uh, bodies in some way or the other. 
So that's the current situation. What are going to, what's the 2020 outlook and the future uh, holding for us? Well, um, clearly we've got um, a long, number of long-term future drivers. That's putting to, aside to the COVID-19 situation right now, looking at the long-term situation. I think we want to focus on the national visions. Uh, each country uh, more or less has a national vision, driving investment and projects, setting the goals uh, for what projects they're looking for, for getting um, greater private sector participation in projects, and by um, introducing more PPP type projects uh, into their uh, projects portfolio. Um, there's also a major drive to attract foreign investment, attract greater manufacturing capability in the region, to develop new sectors like tourism, and also uh, renewable energy. So there are a number of long-term shared uh, future drivers uh, from in each of the countries. So if you take just the GCC and looking at the value of future work uh, coming up uh, in the in the next in the next uh, few years, five to ten years, we can see that there's an enormous pipeline of uh, of projects yet are planned uh, and not yet awarded uh, in just in the GCC region. Again, we can see that the largest two markets are Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Saudi Arabia has more than $1.2 trillion worth of projects in the pipeline, followed by the UAE at close to $800 billion, uh, Kuwait at more than $200 billion, and then Oman and Qatar between $150 and $200 billion. So we've got well over uh, $2.5 trillion worth of known planned and unawarded projects in the pipeline. So regardless of the current situation, uh, we have in the long run a uh, very active and uh, full projects pipeline which make the region uh, in general a very uh, attractive long-term opportunity for companies wherever you are in the world. And likewise, just in terms of sectors, uh, construction is by far and away the largest sector in the uh, in the GCC region, more than $1.4 trillion. So it's historically been the larger sector. It will continue to be the larger sector, not just in the GCC, but in the Miasa region as a whole. Transport uh, next, so airports, roads, uh, railways, ports, uh, close to $600 billion, and then power, water, oil, gas, petrochemicals, and industrial, making up the rest. Now, uh, in terms of uh, outside uh, the GCC and uh, looking at the continent of Africa as a whole, we also have um, some very uh, significant uh, project uh, opportunities and project pipelines. Now, out, bearing in mind that the Africa projects market is not yet as developed uh, as that in the GCC, uh, but nonetheless, we still have many of the same drivers for projects, in fact, even more urgent drivers uh, than we do in the GCC region. We've got a very fast growing population. We've got a huge demand for infrastructure, huge increases in power and water demand growth year on year. And this is reflected by the sheer scale of investment required. Um, like uh, the GCC, many of these projects are funded by governments, but also you have a lot of development banks and development agencies financing projects all of which have very strict procurement rules, very transparent procurement rules, and also require um, international expertise in order to fulfill these project demands. So you can see here, we have um, a, a requirement of up to $196 billion of projects over the next uh, year or two uh, to fulfill the requirement uh, in Africa. And for uh, you get an idea of the mix of the demand for each of these projects. Uh, in, uh, in, this, in this graph and table here. Uh, clearly, um, Africa is 54 countries. Uh, it's difficult to generalize, uh, but nonetheless, there are significant opportunities um, regard, which, um, regardless of which country uh, you're looking at. And likewise, um, I want to also look at um, the India market. Again, similar drivers. We have huge population growth. We've got a huge demand growth for uh, housing, but also for power and water and infrastructure. And that's reflected by uh, these uh, graphs which show construction output. Um, so we have um, in 2020 close to $600 billion 
of output for the construction industry as a whole, and that's expected to grow uh, to uh, more than 700, to about $730 billion uh, by 2023. So quite significant growth of around 6% a year in the construction industry in India. And then on this slide, you can same data, but here you can see how it's been split uh, into uh, various different segments. Uh, we've got uh, the residential segment here, uh, energy and utilities, uh, commercial and infrastructure. You can see how uh, energy, residential and infrastructure dominate the, the requirements and the growth uh, for the project market in India. Okay, finally, I would just like to um, linger on a couple of projects just to give you an, an idea and a taste of some of the very significant projects coming up. Uh, a lot of these are in Saudi Arabia, funded by the Saudi Public Investment Fund as part of the Saudi 2030 vision. These are the centerpieces and linchpins of uh, projects activity in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and for the vision of the tourism, growth and tourism in the kingdom. So here we have what we call the Red Sea Project. It's a massive tourism project in an untouched uh, Red Sea coastal area of Saudi Arabia. It's worth up to $10 billion. It covers a huge area and is already underway. A lot of offshore island developments, uh, bridges, infrastructure required, utilities and so forth. Uh, but this is going to be one of the uh, Saudi key projects which is going to provide work and opportunities for years to come. Uh, likewise, another key project in Saudi Arabia, a Diria Gate project. This is a cultural touristic development, uh, some $9 billion worth of uh, future projects. There you can see a list of some of the key projects, key packages and contracts already underway. A description up here of the project. Uh, we also have another key tourism project in, in Saudi Arabia, Al Ula, the Royal Commission for Al Ula. Uh, uh, you can see this is like a Petra in the Jordan. This is about um, attracting and developing a tourism industry in this very remote and untouched area of Saudi Arabia. Close to home in Dubai, uh, perhaps the biggest project in construction in the region is this Dubai Creek Harbour project. It will feature the world's tallest tower, more than a kilometre high. Uh, the whole development, which is already well underway, is ex and it costs in excess of $20 billion. It's by EMAR, the, the Dubai a quasi-government entity, it's going to house 500,000 people and these projects I'm circling here, these towers I'm circling here, have already been completed, so it's well underway. We've still got dozens, if not hundreds of towers still to come. It's twice the size of downtown Dubai, which is the area covering uh, Burj Khalifa. So Dubai has done this before and it's doing it again. It's going to offer two decades worth of projects. Likewise, another major project to come is the Al Maktoum International Airport. It will be the world's largest airport at uh, uh, a capacity of more than 120 million people a year. Um, it's the first major package on it is expected to be awarded later this year. Clearly, there were question marks around uh, aviation and uh, uh, tourism in general globally, but Dubai tends to um, ignore those things and look longer term. So we're not building for today, we're building for three to five years time. And these visions and these goals are not going to be um, set aside um, temporary, you know, by these temporary issues that we're experiencing today. I've worked for many years to come. And then finally, just looking at this project, this is a big entertainment like Disneyland type project near Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, it's called Qadir. It's a fast track project costing $5 billion. Um, it's well underway as well. And um, this is going to be a basic new tourism leisure uh, park covering a massive area uh, designed for the Saudi population. And again, it's going to offer opportunities for many years to come for companies both in the region and looking at opportunities uh, within it. So this is just a taste of some of those exciting projects. Um, many, many, many more billions of dollars of, of, of great projects which are underway and will um, keep the pipeline busy for many years to come. So I think I might have overrun slightly uh, my allotted time. Um, if you please feel free to get in touch with me if you want more information. These are my contact details and um, I'll be happy to answer your questions later. Just fill in uh, the question box below and uh, we'll come around to um, answering any specific questions you might have uh, later. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'll pass you on uh, to our next, next speaker. Thank you.
Good morning. It is nice to see that we have what I can see some 89 participants this morning. Welcome and yeah, good morning to everybody. I introduce myself quickly. I'm Iris Heinz. I'm a senior consultant for the German Emirati Joint Council in, in Dubai. The German Emirati Joint Council is the official chamber of commerce in the region, the official arm of the German Chambers of Commerce. I just want to cover quickly today what is AHK, what are our services, even in the current crisis, what do, what can we offer? Just two slides to the trade in Germany. I, I find it quite difficult to compare it to 2020. It's very difficult to see what's going on this year, how we are going to trade, how we are going to recover. It might be more prudent to do that later in the year to have a look, but at the moment I would like to stay away from that a little bit. And of course, what is AHK doing in the current situation, how we can help German companies even so our services seem to be limited, they are not. And of course, what kind of information in regards to the UAE economy, to support packages and so on we can give. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. As you can see, um, the HK UAE has quite a big region under there. We, are, we have offices in Kuwait and Qatar. We have two offices in the UAE, one in Abu Dhabi in the capital and one in Dubai. And we do have offices in Iraq as well, in Baghdad and Erbil. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. That would be the services. This is part of our team. That's us. It's just a small part of our team. But we are, you can see everybody's smiling. We're all positive. We have, we are still offering our services. We have changed a lot of the services from face to face, from hands on to digital to online services. We still do network events. We have changed our seminar events to webinars, as you can see today. And it's working really well. And um, trade fairs. We'll see how that goes. We still hope that, of course, it will continue next year, hopefully at the latest, or there might be some change into virtual trade fairs. It will be interesting. I think this is, will be a very interesting industry to watch what's, what's going to be there. I think this is, yes, one of the industry we really have to watch. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is a promised, one of the promised slides for the actual trade from last year compared to 2018. As I said, 2020, I do find difficult because we only have the numbers for the first three months. They are really quite good, but I don't think they're indicative for the rest of the year. 2019 had a um, rise again in exports from Germany to the UAE. As you can see, there was um, an, a, a rise of by 5.1%. And if you can go to the next slide, please. We are strong in transport equipment, as you can see. It's mostly uh, aircraft and aircraft um, related equipment. Road vehicles have gone down a little bit, surprisingly, but all the others have risen quite strongly. It's, it's our traditional market. It's what we, what we do Germans quite well. Machinery, electrical equipment, tech. We are good technicians, really, to say. If you can go to the next slide, please. And here I would like to go what we are offering at the moment. DE International is our department where we are offering services. We have quite a few different departments. We have a trade fair department in our AHK. We have the DE. DA, um, services. We have a strong members department. I think the HK has approximately 500 members at the moment from mostly German subsidiaries in the UAE, but of course a lot of German, co uh, a lot of local companies and other um, members as well. So of course, because of the strong membership, we offer a lot of networking events. We offer a lot of events in regards to information, legal, trade, finance costumes, of course, at the moment, how to deal with the crisis, how to do communication online, how to work still as a team, if you cannot go to the office, 
how to do it from home. I mean, our we have nearly daily webinars at the moment and it's amazing to see how interested people are and how positive people are. We haven't seen really a slowing down yet in our services to our clients from Germany. German companies are still interested to come here to do business here. We haven't seen anything yet to, there is no, there's no slowdown yet. And I would ask you also, if you can go to the next slide, please. To have a look at our websites, we have a full range of information on our website in regards to support packages offered by the UAE in regards to the economy, what free zones are offering at the moment, what is done, what kind of initiatives the UAE is doing at the moment to support, of course, the employees here in regards to HR. It's all there. We have a um, dedicated website for that. And of course, um, it would be great to hear from you. All our services can be done online, digital. It's amazing. And we'll see, I mean, maybe we even can start trade fairs virtually as well. Would be great, wouldn't it? To have the same setup. And I don't know, by drones, by something to see, I mean, what, it, it, it's possible. I'm sure it is possible. But I mean, best case scenario is that we would be back to normal next year and that we can have face-to-face -face meetings there as well again. Um, yeah, let's be positive. Let's work together. And thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you today to you. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. I just want to apologize for the technical mishap there. Um, we will send the recording out to everyone, uh, so you will see it in more detail. Meta? Thank, thank you, Iris. Thanks, Eleni. Yeah, I will take you through some highlights of the big five in the next slides. Um, the big five is the largest and the most influential building and construction show in the Middle East, Africa and South Asia. It's celebrating it is 41st year in 2020. And uh, there are six uh, other specialized events at the Big Five taking place. Uh, the Big Five Heavy, Middle East Concrete, HBACAR Expo, Middle East Fall, Design and Landscape Expo. Products covering the full construction cycle from inception to completion on display from seven main product sectors with two of them are being new focus for 2020, which are digital construction world and intelligent buildings. The stats you see on my screen are the audited actuals from 2019 event. The big five attracts over 67,000 attendees from the world, around the world, to meet with over 2,500 exhibitors coming from 61 countries. Majority of the global leaders coming to the Big Five achieve their goals, which are mainly around promoting their brand successfully, launch new products, or finding distributors in the region. While 65% of our visitors coming from the UAE, the rest mainly comes from the wider region that is Middle East, Africa, and South Asia primarily to meet with suppliers, discover latest innovations, and of course, source new international products. The big five attracts buyers and decision makers from various professionals in the construction industry. The big five offers over 250 Edu uh, 240 educational sessions from conferences to talks and engaging networking features for the most influential players in the industry. Every year, more than 50 German companies attend to the Big Five, 
uh, in the pavilion and another 50 attends individually. For those individual participants, we offer German packages. There are four federal pavilions at the Big Five 2020, uh, which are from Bavaria, Baden, uh, Baden Württemberg, Hessen, and Saxony. If your company is based in one of these federal states, please get in touch with the relevant pavilion organizers for further details. Besides the four federal pavilions at the Big Five, there's another official funded pavilion for Germany for the Big Five Heavy and the Middle East Concrete, which is the German Federal Minister for Economic Affairs and Energy. For more information on the Big Five Heavy and Middle East Concrete Pavilion, as well as Big Five individual participation, please contact our German representative office, Messen Marketing. Thank you. This ends my presentation. We will continue with the Q&A session and we will try to answer as many questions as we can in the limited time we have. Over to you, Eleni. Thank you, um, everyone. Um, we have some questions coming in the Q&A box and I just want to encourage everyone listening, if you do have any questions, please send them uh, into the Q&A box um, and please add the speaker's name uh, with who you are asking. Uh, first question I have is, um, I think this is directed to Ed, um, how are countries in the region reacting to COVID-19? Uh, thanks, uh, Eleni. Good, good question. Um, so clearly we've got uh, challenges with COVID-19 and the, the, the falling oil price and obviously the questions around health and safety and security. Generally speaking, uh, construction activity in the region has been maintained. That is that there was an exclusion or an exception given to construction companies uh, and they were requested to keep projects ongoing uh, and not stop. Uh, and I think that's a, a sign of just how important governments in the region view uh, the need for projects and the, the importance of construction to the local economies and uh, the need to maintain their long-term vision for projects. So construction has been maintained, uh, activity on sites has been maintained. What we've also seen is we have seen a slowdown in some tenders and project awards. However, we've also seen um, a lot of new tenders being issued. Uh, we've seen um, uh, some big contracts awarded as well in the last few weeks. So it, we haven't seen a suspension or stop of all project activity. Things are still uh, continuing and I expect that uh, to maintain or uh, to be continued throughout the, the, the year. Um, what I think is going to be affected maybe is of course um, government budgets and so um, there will be some projects uh, which will be slowed um, that's inevitable however um, we, we you know we still see just how important projects are for for the region and I think um, when you're looking at this that the political capital involved in some of these projects and the importance of, of them to the economy the government's realizing that it's important to maintain spending on projects to keep the economy going I expect that we will see um, still see quite a lot of activity this year, albeit um, at a slightly a lower level than previous years. But beyond that, and this is where we're really looking, but beyond that, we're looking in the, in the future, the next uh, one to five years, there's a very promising and optimistic outlook. And, uh, uh, and that's going to be the, the case for, for many years to come. There's some very big projects on the way, and uh, I'm very hopeful uh, that um, the industry can get over this, this, these short-term problems and then uh, grow and prosper uh, going forward. Thank you, Ed. Um, we have another one for you. Um, how can we access these projects that you have discussed? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it depends uh, on whether you're a contractor, whether you're a supplier, uh, consultant, or, or so forth. I mean, um, generally speaking, it's quite important to be registered or have a local presence or a local agent uh, in each market uh, in the region, um, te laws tend to uh, insist on having some sort of local agent or incorporation of your company 
uh, in order to win work, in a specific, in, particularly in the, in the public sector. So the first thing to do would be to find a local agent or distributor for your products, uh, or to set up an office, sales office yourselves in each, in each country in order to participate in projects. Uh, clearly, if you have an agent or distributor, uh, you know, one, of the, you know, one of the best ways of meeting them or, or um, evaluating them would be at, at, at events like the Big Five. Um, but it's also important as well uh, to ensure that your products are validated or, or part of the vendor lists with consultants. So it's, it, it's, clear, it's important to speak to the local international consultants, uh, designers and architects who are working on projects in the region to ensure that your products are specified. Uh, and then again, they in turn will, in, uh, will be looking to see whether you have a local presence and whether you are able to distribute and sell locally as well in accordance with the local laws. So a number of things, find yourself a local agent and distributor or set yourself up in the free zone or within the, within the country directly. Uh, get, build relationships with the consultants and architects. And if you're selling to the contractors or subcontractors, then build relationships with them. And of course, you know, use um, you know, market intelligence locally through your local agent or distributor or through project tracking services, business opportunity services like Mead projects. Uh, and, and then finally, of course, you know, attend these big trade shows where everyone is all in one place to understand the market in more detail. Uh, events like the Big Five uh, in Dubai later this year. Yeah, just a quick um, remark from my side. I mean, with if you have any questions to market entry, if you would like to know how to set up a company in the UAE, if you find if you want to find a distributor or agent, or if you have any questions to how to register your products and so on, Ed, Ed mentioned already all the um, aspects of it. Please contact us. We are this is our task. This is our focus. That what we do every day. So please do not hesitate. And um, yeah, I don't want to go back to what Ed already so nicely said. Um, everything is agreed on with that. So please do not hesitate. That's what we are here for. Uh, we have another question. Um, do you have information about the actual situation in the UAE and Saudi about reopening activities with travel and visas for foreigners? Um, please have a look at our website. We keep them up to date on a daily basis. I mean, we don't cover Saudi. I, I showed you earlier the, uh, the regional um, outreach we have, but um, my colleagues and I are updating on a daily basis all those information and have a look at our, yeah, our website. It's there, uh, all the information we have, all information which is officially available, which is substantiated. Yeah, please have a look or contact us then we can send you the link, whatever you need to add. Do you have anything to add there? Um, well, I think um, at the end of the day, the region is built on uh, in and coming out. And you know, 90% of the population in the UAE, for example, is, is, is not UAE, are not Emiratis. And, um, the, the authorities here are desperate to open up uh, the aviation sector and travel industry again. Of course, they're not going to do it until it's ready, um, but it's a clear, clear priority to allow Emirates or Etihad or Dubai International Airport to open again. So I'm optimistic uh, that over the next two or three months, we will see a gradual reopening uh, of the borders and uh, for travel to once again be made. Um, I would also like to have a summer holiday somewhere, so I would be very keen to, for that to happen. Um, but um, you know, at, the, at the end of the day, you've got the safety is the first um, concern, and uh, once it's um, you know, the all clear is given, then I expect that to ramp up. And you know, it's actually not fully closed anyway. You can actually there are flights coming in and out of Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Saudi. In any case, um, so there are some limited opportunities to travel into and out of the region. But of course only on an urgent uh, requirement basis. Um, but fingers crossed, we can expect things to, to improve very soon. Uh, we have a question for Metap, I think. Um, will the Big Five take place this year? See, when this all thing started uh, about like five, six months ago, it was only a problem in China. So Big Five uh, is about seven months away now. So we have all the confidence that we will successfully run the event as planned. However, we will continue to closely monitor the developments and follow any guidelines issued by local or national authorities and 
World Health Organization that may be relevant to ensure the safety and guidance, uh, guidelines uh, for the well-being of our exhibitors and visitors and all our partners. Thanks, Metap. Uh, we have another one. Are there or is there any archive to see which German corporates are currently active in this region? Um, no, we, we do have, I mean, CHK, of course, we, we know who are active in the region or not. We do have an extensive uh, membership list, of course, which is available on our website as well. But if you have a um, question in regards to one or the other of the activities Germany or German companies have here at the moment, please contact us. I mean, we can certainly have a look into it. I mean, yeah, which, which corporate would you be talking about if there? I'll wait for them to send that response yeah. to Paris. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, how can we as partic uh, get participation with your assistance? Are you interested in inviting more German and sorry, more German exhibitors and visitors to attend? Was that for for me, perhaps? Yeah, it could be Meta. Uh, we do have four pavilions, as I uh, presented on uh, one of the last slides that I had, uh, confirmed from Germany. So we had a full marketing campaign going on on all the countries. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's uh, a lot of interest in the region as Ed presented. Uh, a lot of the projects are going ahead. So yes. Um, okay, another one. I think this is for Ed. Um, what is the impact of the delayed project, project in the construction region? Yeah, I mean, as I said uh, before, um, clearly there are going to be some projects delayed and cancelled. I mean, that's inevitable and we can't pretend uh, that that's not going to be the case. Um, you know, we are in a difficult situation and, you know, the world is a very different place now than it was four months ago. But when I, when we look at the projects in the region, they are, they are long, instrumental in the long term uh, economic outlook and, and, and health of the, of the region. Um, these projects are required, they're integrated with the government 10-year plans or the, or the government visions uh, and they are essential to opening up uh, new sectors like renewables, like tourism, manufacturing. Uh, they are essential for uh, growing the economies and for attracting foreign investment. So we are talking about projects which the government really have to go ahead with. They have to proceed with these projects because um, the economy needs them and the, 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 the nations of each you know, in the region need them. So I think, yes, we are going to see some short-term pain. That's, that's inevitable and we are seeing that. But in the long run, and I think we should always think about long-term because relationships we make today uh, or you know, the next six months are, are going to be turning, you know, into results in the next year, 18 months or so. And the projects which we're talking about today are going to be finished in three to five years time. So we are talking about investments made today for the future, not for the now. And I think, um, you know, when, we, when you take that into account, we can be broadly optimistic about the long term uh, outlook for projects in the region. And hey, look, you know, we've got uh, more than three trillion dollars worth of projects in the pipeline. Let's say 50% of them don't proceed. We've still got $1.5 trillion of known projects in the pipeline. And you know, we've had more than $1.5 trillion awarded in the last 10, 15 years. So it's very realistic to expect that we can see a similar amount going forward. Uh, and so I think it's an excellent time, an excellent uh, opportunity to take advantage of, uh, of this pipeline and, and look at opportunities in the region and, and Africa and India as well. I think there's huge growth huge population growth. It's not, these things aren't going to change in the long run. Uh, I think um, there's a, a, you know, a real need for uh, equipment, uh, supplies, contract, uh, construction expertise. And uh, I think uh, it, it offers a real growth uh, area and excellent opportunity overall. 
Thanks, Ed. And um, we've got one for Iris now. How do you perceive the issue of conducting trade shows and ex exhibitions this year in the region? Does the AHK have any digital processes in place to allow your companies to meet with potential distributors virtually? Yes, like, um, I mean, trade fairs at the moment, of course, I can't say anything. This is up to the trade fair organizers, to the companies there, and I'm sure they're working on this already as well. But of course, we our services can be done virtually, they can be done online. That's what we are offering now as well. If you're interested in finding a partner, it's business as usual. You just don't meet face to face. We will do the same thing as we are doing right now. You see me in, you know, face to face. So it's no issue at all. I think times will be changing. I think we will look at a different scope, at different things next year. I think people will realize those things are possible too. I might not have to fly all the time. I might don't have to spend so many hours on the road or on the plane. I can do it like this too. So I think, yeah, those um, tools we are using at the moment, they're definitely a growth industry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would like to add to that as well. Uh, although our marketing campaign is very much focused on bringing quality visitors, we, in the case of some of the countries will be will have restrictions to travel we are of course exploring alternative ways for uh, those visitors to engage with and those exhibitors to engage uh, through digital opportunities uh, thanks mix up iris um iris is another one here for you can companies from nrw also participate in the big five with support of bmwi uh, in your sheet, NRW was not explicitly explicitly listed. Um, if you don't mind, if you can send me this question to my email, because I'm not really in the, with the department for the trade fairs, I will forward this question. I'm sure there is um, there is a way how um, our Germany come from NRW, uh, NRW can participate. Um, I will have a look into it. I will speak to my colleagues and come back to you with with the information. If you can send me um, this to my email address, I don't know. My email address was shown in the presentation. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, one for Ed. Um, do you think that the COVID situation will be challenging for con contractors in Saudi Arabia, considering that in the past even big names struggled in the country? Uh, yeah. I mean. Um you know, Saudi in you know, Saudi Arabia um, can be a difficult country to work in. Uh, some of the red tape and bureaucracy can be challenging. Um, you know, we've got lang language, uh, legal issue. You know, change uh, things are different than than elsewhere, of course. Um, climate uh, and so forth. But um, yeah, I mean, it's very possible for companies to prosper in Saudi Arabia, and we've seen that many times. Many um, successful international contractors and suppliers and consultants working in Saudi Arabia and a big track record there. Um, you know, we have seen some, you know, some companies like Saudi Bin Laden Group, like Saudi Oja, um, you know, go bankrupt in the last few years. But that's got nothing really to do with, um, you know, the, the, the current situation. It's more to do with. Um, some some legal issues or political issues in the kingdom that they had. Um, for international companies, the Saudi Arabia authorities, and indeed in the region in general, are really, really trying to attract foreign investment. And they're trying to make it as easy as possible for international companies to come in now. For the last year alone, we've seen um, it possible to get a visa on arrival in Saudi Arabia. I mean, this was, this was um, you know, something that no one would ever believe just five years ago. Uh, women can drive cars there now, you don't need to wear uh, a hijab uh, wherever you go. Um, it's opening up and they are really trying to attract foreign investment and foreign companies, international companies to come in. And uh, they're willing to, to help, uh, help you set up their local uh, agencies involved uh, and, and government authorities aimed at helping companies come in. Um, so, um, sure, there are challenges of doing business anywhere, and, so, and the region is no exception. Uh, but I don't think you can say there are any specific uh, challenges, particularly that should concern you uh, around doing business in Saudi or any other country uh, in the region. 
Meta, we've got one for you. Can you explain the virtual alternative you are planning for visitors that can't enter the country? Will it be the video conferences between physically present exhibitors and virtually present visitors? Virtual matchmaking platforms, virtual product presentations. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, it's still on the early stages. We are looking the best alternatives on how this can that can be translated into virtual environment. Uh, but at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, the plan is to run the show uh, face to face. If this changes, we will communicate with all our stakeholders on how this is going to work virtually or another way. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, we've got another one. It's not directed to anyone, but do you guess that the crisis will affect construction businesses in terms of average time for conversion of work done to receivables? and the average collection time of receivables once certified? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so we have seen um, uh, payments stretch uh, in the last couple of years uh, for various different reasons. And it's true uh, that um, you know, payments can take a while uh, in, the, in the region. Um, we have seen uh, payments stretch to up to six months and even longer in some um, exceptional circumstances. And of course, the current situation is going to have an impact on, on cash flow as well for many companies. What I would say is, um, you know, know your, your customer uh, well, uh, build a relationship with them so you know their financial health, you know their reliability uh, in terms of payments. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's also recognised that the government's um, understand the problem and the governments of course the key most of the key clients in the region are government related and so there have been a lot of initiatives by the governments places like UAE Saudi Arabia to release payments to contractors uh, so that they can play that can pay their suppliers and subcontractors um, so we have got difficulties with payments but we've also seen a release of a lot of funds uh, to help uh, in, in in the region to help um, uh, to, to, to pay uh, late, late, uh, late payments to help uh, stimulate these uh, contractors that, so that they can pay down the supply chain. Um, so things are improving, uh, but of course, you know, it does depend from company to company uh, what the current situation is. Um, okay, I think that's all the time we have um, for the questions. Um, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, uh, valuable information and thank you all to our attendant, attendees for coming uh, online today. We have recorded the session so we will be sending the recording uh, and the presentation in a couple of days so just keep an eye on your inbox um, and thank you again we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you bye-bye.